This I did in the closet. I can't believe that I was allowed to do this, but you could heat up lead. You can make molten lead, and then you pour them into casts and make these little casts of things. And then I started with clay making my own casts. And then I'm not a good writer, but I thought I was at that age, so I wrote, I was writing an autobiography at the age of eight. <laughs> I don't know what I could have put in it, but <laughs> anyway, I've lost it. <laughs> For a long time, I don't think I really thought of myself as an artist. I just, it's just something I did. And I don't, I'm not sure that I'm working for anybody but myself. <laughs> That's just not a terrible thing to say, but, but how would I know what anybody else is going to want or desire if, if they feel a connection to anything that I do? I'm, I'm happy, but I'm not really working for anyone else. I'm just, just translating the, the, the things that that I read and see and, and think about and um, daydream about. I'm a big daydreamer. I love to daydream. Um, and so, yeah, in that sense, I just do it, and I've always done it. So I did it, I guess you'd say, recreationally. And, and then when I got into college, the art department was kind of, I went to Vassar, and the art department was or the studio art department was practically non-existent. So I took landscape architecture, so I took a lot of mechanical drawings and the stuff that you have to, to, to do that. Um, and, and I realized in retrospect that it was really important because I, map making is just something I've incorporated in. And not all the time at all, but, but a lot of the time um, is kind of like I'm soaring over the, <laughs> the terrain looking down. We have a house in Vinyl Haven and the bats lived in the attic. Just at dusk the bats come out a hole in the, and in the eaves and just there's something about that. They come out in a stream and then they just explode into this cloud and then they'd, they'd separate. I had done some hanging pieces and then I met this glass artist, Ernie Paterno, and I thought, glass bats would be really, really interesting to do. And then I could hang them. So, but then I, there was a show at the Farnsworth, so I put them all together for that. And I had them just like the other, the feathered hen, I had them over, over water and I had them all hung. And I had some airplanes in that one. It's a little bit of nature, a little bit of alchemy. And, um, you know, you can kind of read it like a story in a way. That was kind of what I was thinking. Um, um, I'd like to put together a piece that you could, you could see something different in it every time you looked at it. I've probably had about seven studios in the city, uh, but I'm going feet first out of here. I love this. This is just a great studio. I have so much work. I can see when I when I <laughs> when I'm out and gone. This big dump truck full of work. <laughs> Hurling towards, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to it all, but anyway. I figure if that's not going to be my problem, <laughs> it's a really selfish way of looking at it, but, you know, I'm not going to stop working because I just have too much work. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a pantheist, kind of. I, I, I think if I worship anything, it's nature. It's just the miracle of... of how things how things formed and you know I mean you had this little protozoa this little cell that got bigger and bigger until it crept out of the water and became all these things and then they were all wiped out and then they 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 came back again I mean I think I think the planet Earth is just this miraculous little blue thing floating around and I mean I think that we should have this huge reverence for so if it's that's the spirituality that I um, I think I feel is that we're living in a miracle all the time. Yeah, that we're we're very 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 fortunate. I just don't want to see a UFO. <laughs> I'm just so sure there must be people that are curious about us somewhere. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, now I've rambled on. I can't really remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm not wise enough to give advice to young artists. I think the only thing I'd say is um, be, 
be prepared to spend time alone, to not show as much as you think you deserve. Um, that that um, is, it, it, it might be discouraging, but just if you really love to do it, you'll know. I, I, I do know people who it just was too lonely and, and not rewarding in the way that they had hoped it would be. Um, so they just did something else, which is, which is, you know, that's that's a good decision on their part. But, but, um, yeah. So that that's my advice. Make sure that that's what you really, really, really have to do. <laughs> You go home, you're working on something like an oil painting or a drawing or something, particularly an oil painting, because I find that's the hardest medium of anything I do, are the big oils. Um, and you're thinking, okay, that was a good day, and you go home, and you come in the next morning, and you think, this is really horrible. So then you start repainting it, or sometimes you go home and you think, oh, this has been an awful day. And you come in and think, well, that's not so bad, so... <laughs> You know, it's just coming in in the morning, you see it just just the minute you first see it, as though you were somebody else looking at it, you know? Um, so, so then you have to take that moment in, because once you get into it, it's so hard. You don't know, is this good or bad? Or um, I try not to think about that when I'm, I'm working on something, because it's not productive. Matisse said, your only enemy is your own bad work. <laughs> And I can understand that. Um, you know, do you destroy it? What do you do? Somebody said, don't destroy it until you have somebody you really trust come and say, yeah, you should get rid of that. You know, so. But I think it's a good idea every once in a while if you don't repaint it to, you know, deep six it. <laughs> yeah, I don't do too much analysis of anything, even the books I read. I don't, I mean, maybe it's my limited <laughs> brain capacity, but analysis, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. It's either to me, it comes through and it, it's readable as a work or, or it's missing, it's missing. But, but as far as analyzing it, I mean, that's a very, more of a kind of a physical reaction to it, you know. I think you're, you're, you're always processing what you see and what you read and who you talk to and how it gets all a big soup. Um, I, I, um, I don't know, but I think it does. I don't think there's any one thing you bring to work of any kind, of any kind. I think it's all a little facets of pieces of information that you've gathered. I find I have a different approach to drawing and printmaking. Each thing is different, and you have a different way of, of, of dealing with each thing. Well, here's a clay that said, a drawing is just taking a line for a walk. <laughs> um, you know, I like all of them, and sometimes it's sort of a relief to get to printmaking after you've been laboring over painting, you know. I mean, not that printmaking isn't hard, but it's hard in a different way. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and generally by the time you're actually making the print, you have the idea about what you're going to do. Whereas painting, you can't until you get marks down on the surface. You, you, um, yeah, so, so I like to have those different things because I think, oh, painting is just, it's not what I feel like doing. <laughs> I've done, I do a series. I don't leave it. I do a series and then... Um, and then I go to another thing. Or maybe because I've done a lot of drawings, I've did a lot of figure drawings, so you understand the structure of the body, and somehow that understanding is, is, is a structural thing that I think carries over, so that when I make a line, I think it's always part of something that's unseen, does that make any sense? Um, it's it's um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. That line it stands for something. I do them on the wall, just like those. I can make a narrative that way. I can start at the. Sometimes I start in the middle, 
But if I start on the top, and then and then the story develops, they're they're all a story to me. I had this idea in mind that, that these that, that it was a migration that people were leaving an uninhabitable place and going through these wrecked areas and. Um, um, I mean, none of that is very, and nobody else would read it that way. Um, but I, I do have a, a kind of a narrative for just about everything in my mind. This has happened here, and that's happened there. <laughs> it is in a certain place. So, um, yeah, you get into it, and, and um, it's kind of entertaining to, to, to weave a story around it. I don't want those things to be preachy, you know? I don't want to say, okay, this is the destruction of the world and it's bad, we've made it too hot, we're all going to die. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't, um, I think about those, but I, I, I don't want to proselytize in, in, in the work, you know? you know? I think that, we get enough of that anyway. Yeah, I think, I like to think of it as more of a fantasy that it's going to take you a place, a kind of a new place. You know, there's going to be an elf under a toadstool or something. <laughs>